Hello, hello, and thank you so much for joining the Mid-Atlantic Teaching Artists Virtual Retreat. My name is Jim Wolf, and I work at the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History. This session will be recorded and later shared, so please turn off your video if you do not want to be recorded. Today's workshop is called Teaching Artists in the Elementary Classroom, a discussion on what works, and it will be led by Kylie Proudfoot Payne. I'll now turn things over to our producer for a brief review of some technical housekeeping items. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Kelly. I am your producer, as Jim has mentioned, um, and I will be going over just a few slides before we start. Uh, this first slide um, is um, just telling you how to uh, pin your interpreter video if you only want to see your interpreter. Uh, you go uh, to the picture of your interpreter and, and uh, select, uh, scroll down and select pin. Uh, there's a gallery view um, if you would like to see interpreter and presenter at the same time. Next slide. Okay, great. Troubleshooting. If you get disconnected during this session, please rejoin uh, by using the same link that you uh, initially used. Uh, as Jim had mentioned, today's sessions are being recorded. Uh, if you have immediate assistance, you can call me on my cell. Again, my name is Carol Kelly, and there is my phone number if you want to jot that down. It's 610-401-7190. I'll be happy to help you. Next slide. Okay. Um, in today's event, we're going to be using uh, the chat box and the participant box. I'm just going to tell you where they are. Uh, let's start with the chat box. Uh, it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you click on it, it'll pop right out. You can kind of move it over to one side of your screen. We'll be using that um, to chat to each other. Uh, and secondly, there's a participant box, which is over to your left. Uh, if you click on that as well, it pops right out. Uh, and at the bottom of the screen, there's some icons that we'll be reviewing next. So next screen, please. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, changing your name. Okay, this is where the participant box uh, comes into play. Uh, so uh, hover over your name, click more, and you can rename yourself um, very easily if you need to. And you can uh, add uh, pronouns too if you'd like. So if everyone uh, can see the participant box, go to your name, hit more, and then you can uh, rename yourself if, if you so choose to. So give a few minutes if you want to do that. Um, and lastly is the uh, icons that I mentioned earlier. This is found at the bottom of your participant box. Uh, this is a blue, a blue virtual hand. Uh, if there's a yes and a no check marks that you can use. And uh, we do uh, ask if you put the coffee cup up if you do step away from your um, computer. Uh, do you want to see if you, um, I'll just test everyone to see if they found their blue virtual hand. Uh, can you raise your blue virtual hand? I can see that you did find it. Yep, perfect. I see them all going up. All right, great. I think, and I can clear everybody's blue virtual hand. Uh, I think that's all for me, so uh, I will turn it over to Kylie. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carol. I appreciate it. Um, just a brief introduction of Kylie. Uh, Kylie Proudfoot Payne, who uses she, her pronouns, is the leader in teaching artistry in West Virginia. She's worked as a teaching artist for the past 10 years for Arts Bank Incorporated, which is a small nonprofit organization in Randolph County, West Virginia. Primarily focusing on STEAM workshops, Kylie has developed curriculum and classroom procedures that work within the public school framework and has also developed out of classroom and into the forest programs for all ages. Please welcome Kylie and let's begin. Okay, um, good afternoon. I hope everyone can see my slide and hear my voice. I'm going to try to speed through the basic information in order to get to the discussion portion, which is one of the reasons why I, I kept the grouping so small. I did have the privilege of attending the 
the retreat a couple years ago and and I was able to see in person how this worked. And I really liked the, the smaller group sessions where we were able to chat and and to solve the problems. Of so while I am discussing the first part of this, I want you to write in the chat um, a, a few answers. What is your main form of art? How many years have you thought of yourself as a teaching artist? In what state do you teach? State or region? And your best guess, are you going to be teaching virtually, in person, or hybrid in the upcoming year? So just in the next five minutes or so, just go ahead and put that in the chat um, while I give you some information about what I have done. So first I want to acknowledge the fact that my skills and my expertise and, and everything that I've learned as a teaching artist is built on a foundation of so many teaching artists before me. All of um, the opportunities that I've had from working um, are due to dedicated board members and fellow teaching artists. And I've had the privilege of working with a, a nonprofit, as Jim said, Arts Bank in rural West Virginia. And one of the reasons why we have this nonprofit is because in the 90s, they took art teachers out of the elementary schools and um, a grassroots movement developed in order to incorporate teach, uh, art teachers and thereby teaching artists back into the elementary school classrooms. Um, many things have changed, but for the most part, Arts Bank is still serving that purpose of, of getting art teachers and teaching artists into the elementary school classroom. I came to Arts Bank after working social work and, and basically deciding I could be more effective with the students through art. One of the most important things that I've learned so far is that if you are passionate and interested in what you are teaching your students, then they will be interested in engage, and engaged. As a teaching artist, sometimes I feel like I fall in the spectrum between doing big important things to small menial things, when in reality, uh, the big things and the small things are, are both essential. With Arts Bank, um, we're able to only go into the classroom for a very brief amount of time, about five days per year. And thinking about that, um, Realistically, I, I think, oh, what, what am I doing? Am I actually having an impact? After years of that and carefully developing the, the lessons, we are having an impact and, and the students remember things from the year before. I'll tell you a little bit more about how those programs are, are developed oh, no. through a few more Close slides. That. No. The AC's on. Did you fix it? So how to manage the challenges of the elementary environment. The elementary aged artist can be challenging, but working with students in the school system during COVID-19 regulations or virtually just complicates the whole situation um, as, as I'm continuing to try to redesign all as as I'm sure you are as well redesigning our programs. Um, I don't want to minimize the artistic visions too much. So from the teaching artist perspective, the end product may be very small. But from the student's perspective, it's so big and important. I, I especially see this in the school-wide installations. In the image, that the, the photo that you're looking at on the screen right now, um, that those are elementary age students painting 
um, in tempera on a large sheet. And, and for me as an artist, I, I always, one of my most difficult moments is just allowing them the control and the artistic um, direction. And, and when I have artists, artists slinging paint on a, on a sheet, um, it really, it really creates, it, it begins creating. Okay. So one of the ways to address the challenge is that we think long term. We are providing, with Arts Bank, we are providing yearly programming that will build into something bigger. We design the programs carefully, um, sometimes because of fun, they, they originally developed out of funding needs or restrictions, um, but the, the more carefully we've designed the programs, um, the more they build on each other year after year. So that when I walk into a second grade classroom, um, from, from day one, they're, they're already, um, the students are raising their hand to tell me things that they remember from last year because they see us uh, so, so infrequently. So programs and workshops. Um, I natu my artistic um, background and the way that I develop any of my programs, um, I develop them um, with the STEAM format. It's it's more natural for me, and I and I think that the kids um, they they want to build their learning. Um, together um, rather than dividing it out. So when I build a STEAM workshop, um, I'm, I'm first consulting my, my notes from years past. So for example, some kids, they'll say, I wanna do snakes next year, or I wanna do um, more with painting or weaving. So I do allow um, some of the students' feedback to direct wherever we happen to be going. So with the STEAM programs that we've developed, um, I generally think first of what the students currently need. Um, and in rural West Virginia, um, we, without any art education in elementary school, I am the only art um, the art experience that they're getting. So I teach a couple thousand students a year across the county that I work in. Um, and and it's, we're building on the skills. And um, thinking, of, thinking of the virtual program that we are adapting and building this year, I, I'm trying to to go back into my book and of ideas from the students. And in actuality, I'm going to be using some of their ideas that I thought were completely out of the box and, and not possible. And, um, and this year, they may be possible. For example, the snake thing. So with the Da Vinci Apprentice Program, which I will show in the next slide. For the Da Vinci Apprentice program, one of my students a couple years ago, um, the, the Da Vinci program culminates in some type of drawing from life of an, of an animal or creature, and they really wanted snakes. And I, I never discount any of their ideas, but I, I did question the reality of bringing snakes into the classroom. So, so this year I've already reached out to uh, the DNR and, and we may possibly be able to do a virtual snake lesson. So I, I know a guy who has snakes and, um, and I will, and we may be drawing those from life virtually. So in the Da Vinci Apprentice program, in the image that you can see, those are actually kindergarten students exploring um, anaglyph art. So we, um, we had cyan and uh, red markers, and they were drawing. And I, that took me, that lesson, I had the idea, it took me a couple of years to develop and, and to get the, get the, 
the glasses and and build them into a program but that is definitely a hit and and one of the one of the other things that i do i um we we work from sketchbooks so as soon as we go into the classroom we introduce the sketchbooks and the sketchbooks um do, they they control and they document their learning in order to have a more authentic impact and for them to continue their their sketching i occasionally walk into um, a classroom and the the t and i do work primarily um, in the public schools under an mou and um, I will occasionally walk into the classroom and and the the teachers will say, oh, no, we never read that book. So I think Hello Red Box by Eric Carle is definitely one of the one of the books we, we roll the cart in and and some of the teachers say, oh, that book. But we, we always challenge the students to um, and and when we design um, when I design a program, and sometimes it's in collaboration with another teacher. So in the above photo, that's one of my um, team teachers, Sarah Ferguson, and she's reading a book. Um, and, and that's another way that we try to make more of an impact is we do, we do it as um, in, in a, short a shorter time frame as intensely as possible. So while she's reading the book, I'm setting the supplies out and we function within the school set setting. So we have limited time. It's going to be interesting virtually, but from a cart, I, I always like to teach a simultaneous contrast after image effect, which is a big long word that you wouldn't think would work in an elementary classroom, but they love it. So I um, and, and that was a whole year designed on teaching them how to view things differently. So that was Da Vinci Apprentice year two. And you can see a Fibonacci spiral there as well. So carefully created STEAM projects. This is, these are a couple um, images from the school-wide installations. Um, I, I like, I think of it as prescribing art to students and, and really trying to figure out what they need. So um, sometimes, sometimes it's a school-wide installation. And in the left, in the on the picture on the left, school-wide installation, um, that is a storybook forest. So they had recently changed um, their library to to not be utilized daily and it was kind of the sore spot for that school so we embraced the library and the books and each student from the school created um, an art uh, created artwork that culminated into a school-wide installation the video oh, the the image on the right that is from an ocean mural installation because we, we we put the art up and then we take the art down so those are also images from the um the ocean installation at a small school and this project developed out outside of the Usually we go in with a few different ideas, but this school was a little different. They didn't, we didn't really have a plan for them, for them. So we, we went into the school and we, we met the teachers and we, we went around to the different classrooms and they actually coordinated with um, an aquarium and so then we decided to go ahead and em embrace that and and have an ocean installation this is another example of a school-wide installation i i think that you know thinking big as teaching artists not going in to 
to present something that an art teacher or a classroom teacher would would be able to portray. So, so I take in acrylic paint and tempera paint and with respect of the teacher's carpet. Um, so, so they, they always, sometimes the teachers are a little concerned that we may end up filling paint on the carpet, but we, um, we're respectful of their space. It's another image of uh, the installation artwork coming together. And that is an, uh, one of the school-wide installations. Um, this was based off of a book and had to do with kindness. That was the Colton Kindness mural. This is another installation, a Van Gogh installation. And uh, we had extra plastic and we, we painted with acrylic on plastic. So, so a, a couple of the programs aren't steam based, um, but they, it, it's, we, we try to figure it out per school. When I say we, I mean Arts Bank. And um, um, I work uh, very closely with uh, Sarah Ferguson, the other cooperating artist. And that's the Van Gogh installation. I'll give you a second to look at that one as I scroll through. So the installation that that kind of has those were good examples of the installation process. I we tried to incorporate as much art in a very short period of time, and most of the installations were done in schools with either 150 to 350 students. So they are smaller schools, um, and and we're able to um, do them within four to five days. Another program that we run is out of the forest and into the classroom, or out of the classroom into the forest. I said that backwards. This is part of a program that won't be able to happen this year. And this is our program where we take students out of the classroom into the, the Monongahela Forest, which is um, surrounding Randolph County and adjacent areas. Um, for the past six years, seventh graders have participated in this program. This is one of the ones, one of the program, the only program that we, um, that we do that's not elementary age. Um, we and this basically, um, this basically, um, basic the the essential part of this program is journaling in the forest. We coordinate with scientists and and other professionals, and they are able to come into the forest with us. So so one artist will be paired with one science. Um, a scientist, and and then we develop collaborative programming. So I have another slide. So social distancing is not feasible in the in this programs, and and we also have them travel. It, we also have them travel. Um, from their school into the forest. So uh, since this won't be happening, this is actually one of the programs that we will be doing um, that, that we will be doing virtually and trying to introduce this into the younger classrooms. So the students working virtually from home, we're going to develop a, 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 a sketchbook or a journal, and then it will use some of the things that we've done in Arts in the Earth to develop those into videos um, and, and virtual um, sessions to, to take this program now into the elementary school.
So tips and tricks. What can teaching artists do to adapt? I've mentioned a couple things that I've briefly mentioned a couple things that we'll be doing. Um, with Arts Bank, um, we, we, we stopped one program in the middle of the program, which we are adapting um, to continue presenting in the, in, in the classroom um, through the cooperating teachers. Um, really, I have, I have classroom teachers reaching out to me and asking what's happening, what are we going to do this year, and how is it going to be done. So, um, we're, I, I've been recording some of the videos and then having a standalone video presented on a website and then the, the teacher will get access to that website and then we'll schedule a virtual meetup. Ideally, that's what we hope to happen. Um, but in West Virginia, one of our problems is that internet and, and connectivity and technology, um, not all of the students have good internet. Not all of the teachers have good internet. <laughs> so, so we're struggling through that. And, and with, with possible plans of packets um, in the second semester. So I'm going to, I, I've talked a lot, but I am going to open this up. One of my favorite things is, is, is talking to other teaching artists. So I am going to stop my share and I want to open it up to um, possible questions or ideas as to what you may be thinking about for the next year. So I, I haven't been watching the chat, which I will, if there are any questions in the chat, I will address those after um, afterward. So raise a blue hand if you have any ideas um, or want to say anything or comment or questions. Anyone? Okay, Julie Jackson, I saw yours first. Please unmute yourself. Julie Jackson, we cannot hear you yet, but I see your hand, your blue hand is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering, did you mention packets that you're thinking about for the second semester? Yes. Can you expand so, on that a little bit? Yes, I, I will talk a moment about packets. So a lot of our a lot of our programs use very basic materials. Um, generally, the lead, uh, we want to be able to design a program that the students can then replicate um, at home. So we yeah. don't always want to give them things that they can't continue. So um, a lot of our programs are based off of sketchbooks with pencil and drawing and um, collage, so glue and paper. So if so our idea is that we will in the fall semester on um, on more basic uh, supplies and then develop a packet that will be some of the more elaborate I use drawing pencils a lot. Right. So the Faber-Castell drawing pencil 4B, uh, that's one of my go-to supplies and tortillions or blending stumps. And I teach kindergartners how to use a drawing pencil um, with a tortillion. And then we build on the program each year so that by the time they're out of fifth grade, even though they've only had five days each year, their, their drawing skills have improved compared right. to schools that don't have drawing. So I'm imagining that a packet may have um, a small glue packet and some scraps of paper for anaglyph collage or collage using um, simultaneous, well, 
contrasting colors or or having maybe a sharpie marker for some of our so, some basic supplies that we can work work from then those supplies will be boxed up and delivered to the schools and then the schools will um, distribute those supplies got it i'll be doing that with head start but uh, i'll be delivering packets each month for each child with any extras they'll have the basic supplies and we'll deliver from our art center the extra supplies for whatever project yeah i i think that I, I i've talked to a lot of people and it seems like that's the way that we're heading um i will say that as for i we do a lot of collage so uh, here's a here's a tip and trick that probably most of us know but if you don't know this um if you're using glue um use elmer's school glue and not the glue all so I, I know that with small hands, sometimes it's more convenient to have the, the bottle of glue, but if you have um, the bottle of glue and it's glue all, if you squeeze it, 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 you can get about half of the bottle out, but then the glue all, because it's stickier, almost like a craft glue, then, then it's just the frustration of <laughs> it, it adheres to the side. So school okay. glue. Good idea. Thank you. Yes. And and we're and I'm planning on we in Arts Bank, we always do an applicator. So we'll use a Q-tip, which the, the students may have at home, and then we'll we'll have a small piece of paper. Um, small piece of paper, and um, then we'll put the glue there, and then they will apply the glue kind of drop by drop. Yeah, great. Good ideas. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Raise your blue hand if you have any other questions. Okay. So I have a fantastic tech assistant, my daughter here. She is Zoe Bree, um, who has who has compiled some of the questions. Uh, what challenges do you anticipate within the coming upcoming year? Virtually, what materials and space requirement can be expected? Okay, yes. So, virtually, what can we what can we anticipate? Um, what can we anticipate in the upcoming year for the students to have at home, virtually as a space? So, I talked a lot about. Um, I talk a lot about visual arts, but dance and music and, and creative writing, um, they're, they're going to require some different um, space requirements and, and the theater arts. So I, I know um, that as a parent, time delay on the dance um, education has been a bit of an issue, um, but um, I, I think that through Arts Bank, we do, uh, we do some of, I, I'm not a performing artist, but I, I do think that um, if you have just working within the space that you have. So even if it's constrained, um, I, I've always, I, I've always told most of my art students, if you if you have a barrier or a constraint, try to work within it. So, so in that way, we're going to be using virtually for me in some of my lessons, we're going to be using leaves and sticks and and things that they can find around their house. Um, all right. Any other questions, um, Dylan? Dylan, would you like to unmute? Hi, I'm, uh, I, I pronounce my name Dylan, but that's okay. Dylan, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Dylan. As a uh, storyteller who's been doing this since 1990, uh, just a couple of comments. I can always tell um, what type of school I'm in when I walk in and see artwork on the walls. It's impressive. It shows that there's a, a um, uh, it's a school where either there's an excellent art 
teacher or they value the arts. And I just had a thought because uh, sometimes my, 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 um, my garage was filled with artwork from kids, uh, elementary kids, especially the kindergartners. And I would just put them up, you know, I'd get 30, 40 every performance. But um, that's a way to get the juices flowing. And maybe uh, I'm thinking if there was a cooperation with the English teacher and what books the kids actually read and the kids can draw from it. Um, and I don't know how, again, I'm, I'm not in the classroom, but um, I'm thinking that, that the kids might find some, some solace in doing, uh, creating art from what they're experiencing at home. And if there was some type of project that the kids could do and turn in weekly or every two weeks, I mean, physically draw, physically create, so that when school does open, that artwork could be placed in the hallway, not just as a reminder, but the fact that they had they have learned not being within those walls. So it's, it, I'm just throwing it out there because it's a it's a good way to fill up the hallway with artwork, and um, and it could be you know for a book or for a certain subject or whatever. So it, it's an opportunity to do some cooperative learning and and also teaching. So I'm just throwing that out there. And I also have a storyteller come on and tell a story and have the kids draw from it. <laughs> a little self-promotion, but thanks. Yes, yes, thanks. definitely. I, I, some of my favorite collaborations um, was with a storyteller. So she, she's moved away, but I, I still use some of her classroom techniques and classroom tips. And, and I think that's a great idea of filling the halls with their art um, so that if they are creating virtually, even if it's just printing it out or submitting it or turning it in, making it feel like their home, their school. So yeah, I love that. I love that idea. Okay, let me switch to another slide. The challenges, so challenges we anticipate within the upcoming year. Um, there are going to be many challenges. I think for me personally, the, the biggest challenge is going to be, it is going to be the connectivity. Um, does anybody want to speak to some of their challenges? raising your hand. What? Okay, sorry, I'm scrolling. Okay, well, despite connectivity, um, I, I think that the packets that we were talking about earlier and materials. So most of my most of my art arts would require different materials, and I'm going to have to challenge myself with what what will the students have in order to create, and um, and and go from there. Andrea, would you like to speak to that? Hi, sorry, I was going to just comment on the challenges as you, you'd kind of yes. asked a little bit. Um, I'm a theater teaching artist and I'm going to be going virtual. And for me, the biggest challenge that I'm trying to figure out how to address in this age group is that most of the theater work is done in groups or connected, whether physically or speaking after each other. Um, and so looking at how to more individualize the theater stuff so that kids can do it whether most likely from home separately um so most just more more basic skills as opposed to the interaction that normally as goes with theater it just changes it a lot so that's sort of for me the challenge that i'm trying to solve um and so, so i think that theater wise um i i think it depends on the level of technology that they have i i know that um some of the ideas that we've thought of would be um, them taking pictures and recording themselves. So um, develop, I, I do think that they, 
they like to take pictures of themselves and record themselves. So with the technology, um, it may not work for the lower elementary, but definitely third, fourth, and fifth grade. They, they like to record themselves. Um, you may give thought to um, teaching about appropriate recording and length of recording. And, and so it's actually, that's a great uh, STEAM-based program of <laughs> incorporating technology. And uh, I have a feeling that <laughs> this generation will be fantastic at technology by the end of this. So uploading and, and editing. So I, I think that there are some resources out there for, for some of that. I, I think that um, we, we have a, a large theater program in, in our area and they go into the schools. They've, they've mainly gone into the schools as performance group and, and they're thinking of different ways to, to reach the students and, and get their participation. As, as an artist, I, I love to create props. <laughs> so so if, you can, if you can get through some of this by creation of props and masks and, and, and collaborating with, with others, uh, but maybe with another teaching artist um, who, who could, um, could work with that. And um, so a question in the chat, I think the big question is, will schools be willing to spend money on our programs with so many challenge they, challenges that they have to face just to bring their regular content? That, that is the big question. Um, with ArtsBank, I know we're trying to be the solution to some of our local schools' questions. <laughs> So, so, so they are, they are, their challenge is to how to provide the virtual content and what to provide and in what way. And, and we're trying to be their answer. I've reached out to some of the teachers that I have, that, that have contacted me and I've contacted them asking them what, what are you planning um, and, and how can we help you. So if you if you make yourself if if you if you are a resource for them, then hopefully they will pay for your program. Any other anyone else want to speak to that question? How are we solving that problem? Hi, this is Jennifer. Um, I'm a dance educator, so similar issues with there's a lot of collaboration and all of that, but I am going to be teaching um, social studies and gym content through dance all virtually um, to second graders. So wow. I've given it a lot of thought for a lot of what we do is the kids creating their own movements and creating dances. And I think this is an opportunity for them to focus on their own sequences and then allowing them to be the teacher, um, to be the one sharing with the class. So I think in some ways, I'm like, this might actually be more manageable than in a large space of 30 kids um, dancing and trying to, you know, focus on yes. their own creative works and they're in second grade. Um, so I imagine that with good prompts that we can build something really interesting. So I'm looking forward to the challenge personally um, but there are definitely some hindrances. There's no partner work. There's no, you know, the touching, the, that interactive piece. Um, so I think thinking of their device and their classmates, depending on how you use the screen, if you're hiding people, you can have, have them perform in groups because you can have just the people sharing on the screen. I don't know if you guys know how to use Zoom in that way. Um, so there's lots of cool things that I think can come from it, but it's going to take a lot more planning. Yes, and I and I think that um, and I think that when the participants, so when the student participants are interacting with the screen and learning the 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 um, the content, I think that for them it's going to be just as important for 
us as teaching artists to then present the information that they've provided back to them because I, I, I found that it's a little overwhelming just having all of the, the images and the, the messages, but um, I, 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 I'm excited to see um, the, kind of the dance recordings like sent back to them, like this is what you created. So I, I think um, I think maybe this is a great time for introducing um, kind of informal and positive critique. So I, I know that um, it, in in dance they'll be able to watch it afterwards. So so I, I I would definitely I would definitely record those and then present it back to them. And you probably already thought of that. I, I didn't mention critique, um, but I do like to in, include critique in the um, in my programming. So I, I want them to have a positive connotation with the idea of critique, but I want them to think about their art and I want them to think about the process and the viewing of it. So I know that um, with time constraints and being in a classroom and rushing out with the card and trying to gather up all the materials, I am also kind of looking forward to maybe having the flexibility of of a little more time, a little more, um, a, a, an easier schedule. And that way we can, the, that way we can get more into the cr critique and analysis of it. Because if you've not had a critique with a kindergarten, first or second grade student, they're amazing. So the, their, their view of it and their perspective is, is just so pure. Has anyone critiqued with their students? Raise your hand if you could, or raise the blue hand if you have critiqued with students. Okay. Maybe one of my favorites. So what materials and space requirement can be expected? That Am I still? Yeah. So space-wise, I I think that. Hold on a second. I'm having a tech issue. Okay, I'm back. So space-wise, I um, I'm just going to need a flat surface. Dancers will need a little more, sir. A, a, a little more. Um, so does anybody want to speak to uh, materials and and space requirements? I, I'm a theater artist. This is Jennifer Ridgeway. Jennifer. Hi, Kylie. I've been, um, I hope you guys can hear me well. I'm having some um, issues, but. Um, I can hear you. Okay, great. So um, I did some virtual teaching in the spring and, um, you know, I am, and I appreciate the comments that the dancer and the theater artist before me um, shared of the, the challenges um, and also the openness to embracing this as an opportunity right now um, to um, what I kind of discovered was I feel like it, it was landing so much more for me in the inspiration space and that stu the students it was I was really getting to witness their um, their what sparked them and what ins um, inspired their curiosity and their uh, interest in moving into theater and storytelling it with um, drama. drama. Um, so that is all exciting. But um, in terms of materials, I have, um, you know, because theater is very different than movies and it feels very movie-esque when you're in this little Zoom box. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out what that is and what that difference is, how to differentiate that. Um, and so part of what I did was I um, developed a moving desk, standing moving desk 
on a dolly, a little dolly, and I have two, three apple crates, and then I put my laptop on top of that. Um, and I just find that is like changed my world. I just throw that out there to everybody. A moving desk seems fun. I, I also am taking my studio wherever I, I plan on going. So I will, um, I, I plan on taking my virtual classroom outside and into other spaces. So maybe the students can't get out and about, but I do plan on, on taking my virtual classroom out and out um, and, and trying to use those negatives as a positive. Um, I'm going to run through a few tips and tricks just, I, I've talked about glue and, um, hey, Kylie, I, the, yes, Sorry, can I interrupt real quick? Yes. Um, just pointing out Rebecca, I believe still has a hand raised, um, just in, in case she wants to add anything. And also I wanted to just mention in the chat that Kat has shared a link to Flipgrid. Um, which, she which is described as a uh, resource shared in a media arts focused webinar. Um, and uh, Kat has interest in testing that for theater exercises. So I just wanted to call everyone's attention to that as well. Yes, and uh, Rebecca, is your hand raised? Would you like to talk? Yes, or, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, well, going back to your question about um, pr uh, critique process, um, my students are K through five and they do an early critique process. Um, I have some little um, images of a clock. So each of them gets one image of a clock when they're doing a gallery view and they get, to, it's like on a post-it note and um, they get to place it on the thing that they think took the most amount of time. And um, I have a green post-it note with the money sign and they get to post it on the one that they think should cost the most amount of money. Or um, the, the one work that they think should take first place, you know, um, they'll put a little first place uh, sticker on it. So that way they have three post-it notes and they can't all go on the same work of art. So then we discuss what they like about each of why they think this one took the most amount of time, why they think this one should cost the most amount of money, and why they think this one should get first place. So it's kind of taking their critique process to a different level. I love what the, um, the last speaker, I can't remember her name, was it Jennifer, said yeah. something about curiosity, um, a work of art maybe that creates more curiosity they like to see more of. Um, anyway, so, Yes. For critique, it's not necessarily good and bad. It's more about what resonates, you know, and that's something we discuss um, early before the creative process, um, that idea of resonating. But anyway, I am going to be teaching this year in an outdoor environment, and um, I've contacted the schools and told them um, about some of my outdoor lesson plans that they can pick and choose from and that I can come after school if they want the parents to select um, Select to do it if they want, you know, for a small fee yeah. or if they want to pay for a whole school Then I'll do it during the school day. So I have some flexibility with my own time to be able to do that But I've gotten a very good response um, From the different schools I've contacted in my area. So that's that's really good, given that, that, um, that sounds wonderful. Where we're at. <laughs> outside so, environment, um, I love it. Just <laughs> things like I do um, printmaking with leaves and things and ferns, and I do cyanotypes, and of course we do a Jackson Pollock painting for the whole school. So you really get a lot of layers if you do all the ages in one work of art. So anyway, okay. Thank you Sounds for letting wonderful. me share. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And and I think that the critique process, especially, I, I think that what could help um, you, your critique process, that may translate virtually fairly well, maybe uh, through whatever platform of, of giving thumbs up or high fives or 
um, I, I, I think that that could potentially work as a, as a way to um, do a virtual critique. The post-it notes may be um, thumbs up. All right, have I missed anyone who had their hand up? I don't think so. Let me... So I'm going to just, the few other things. Um, so, so if we were displaying things on the wall, uh, this is something you may already know, but hot glue works great in schools for putting up um, artwork. Um, I, one of my favorite materials, I've mentioned the drawing pencils, tortillions. I'd also include 80 pound paper um, in, in my packet. So if I'm going to be dropping off supplies, I'm going to be including 80 pound paper because 80 pound paper can have, um, it, it will take pencil, paper, or collage, uh, watercolors, and, and even acrylic um, and sketchbooks. I, I really think that uh, we'll, one of our main projects will be sketchbooks and, and basically developing all of our programs from sketchbooks this year um, in order to try to bypass that connectivity issue. Um, I think those are a lot of my, those are some of them. And, um, Students are natural storytellers. So I think that maybe um, this, is, this is the time to, to listen to their stories because they've been through so much. And, and this has been a, a, a life-changing experience for them. And I think as teaching artists, um, maybe, maybe listening to their stories and giving them that performance platform in, in this world will be, will be something that can, can help them through this process. So I, I know that we're going, to, we're going to create a space for them to um, perform and, and talk. So, all right. Time-wise, Jim, I think we are at 3.28. We are, yeah. We're about to wrap up. Um, Kylie, do you have anything else? I have a couple of little final notes for, for everyone, um, unless you would, you have some closing remarks. Um, I did share my, or, or Carol Kelly did share the uh, slideshow presentation um, um, in the chat box and, um, the Flipgrid. I, I hope everybody uh, will will grab that link. I know I will, and and I will also be on the Facebook page uh, to answer any questions because I think that the teaching artist community is is going to be central in developing these connections and 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 kind of maintaining our 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 progression through this, this weird world that we live in. And I, I, um, I, I do want to say that I have really enjoyed uh, the Teaching Artists of the Mid-Atlantic meetings. Uh, so there are also um, some Monday cafes uh, that maybe Jennifer could share in the chat. Jennifer Richway, can you share a link to that? Some I will definitely do that, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so that was a great um, just networking community and staying in touch with other teaching artists. I think that's it, Jim. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Kylie mentioned the Facebook group, um, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the, the, the Teaching Artist Retreat Facebook group. The link to that is posted in the chat as well, um, as, and it was also in the emails that you received inviting you to the session. So we encourage everyone to, to go there. As, as Kylie said, she'll be joining that after this session. And uh, if anyone wants to continue the conversation or, do, or uh, offer any more in-depth comments, um, we would love for, for you to do that. I really want to thank Kylie for today's presentation. Um, I want to thank our producer, Carol, our interpreter, Connie, um, for, for being here today. And really for, to all of you for joining us and 
for offering uh, support to one another and these great, very specific, very helpful suggestions that you've shared today. Uh, thanks very much to everyone. Uh, before we end, we would love to just take a minute to hear from you uh, about how this, uh, this presentation resonated with you. Um, our producer uh, is going to post a quick poll uh, on the screen uh, as I wrap up here. So uh, I'd like to tell you that um, recordings, um, as we, and, and Carol, I believe, is here, there's the poll, yeah? Uh, three questions. Um, this session enhanced my understanding of the topic. Uh, this session was well organized and professional, and this session provided me with new ideas or strategies. And uh, again, recordings of the workshop uh, and others will be available on NASA's YouTube page uh, within the week. Look to the chat to see a link to our Facebook group, and please join us there to offer your reflections. Um, also, watch your email inbox for a brief survey every Friday uh, about the retreat to let us know what you think. And uh, we hope you'll join us for this afternoon session on protest poetry, that's at four o'clock, and for additional sessions in the coming weeks. Remember to also join your state's cohort uh, for the weekly meetups on Thursday afternoons. The 2020 Mid-Atlantic Teaching Artists Virtual Retreat is a co-sponsored project of the Mid-Atlantic uh, State Arts Agencies in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. We're very grateful for the generous support of all of these collaborators and we're grateful for your participation today. Thank you all very much. Goodbye and we'll see you at the next session or on Facebook. Thanks again. <laughs>